Isn't it awkward when you just sit in silence for five seconds? When I worked at the radio station, five seconds of silence on there was, was grounds for firing. So we had to say something. So Today we will say something. Too late is never too late. Amen? Go with me to John eleven twenty five. Too late is never too late. John eleven twenty five. Now, I know it is uh, the third Sunday of January, 2021. Resurrection Sunday this year is April the 4th. Anybody looked at your calendar? Easter's kind of early this year, April the 4th. But I, I really feel like right now we need to hear about life and not death. Amen? So we're going to talk a little bit about resurrection this morning and what it means. And we're going to apply that individually to our lives, okay? Too late is never too late. John eleven twenty five 25 says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. Will live again. Clive, would you ask the Lord to bless this morning? Amen. Clyde has his own story of resurrection. Amen. And uh, verified by the doctors in Washington. Well, today isn't Resurrection Sunday, but it might as well be. And maybe you and I need to think of each Sunday as being that Resurrection Day. Because Resurrection Day is a day of tremendous hope and victory for every person. And when you begin to feel like the culture is closing in around you and it's hard to see the slithers of light, we need to remember in whom we believe and that he has given us the victory. Thank you. And hope. Got one over here. Today God says to us, you're too late is not too late for me. The psalmist put it into words like this, 30 verse 5. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Used to be my favorite Bill Gaither trio song, Sharon. I played that on the LP. Remember LPs, long play albums? It went circle like round, round like this with a needle. And it was beautiful. Come or see, hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Sing it with me. Weeping only lasts for the night. See, three of you knew that song. And a lot of you a lot older than me. Marty. The fact that Jesus rose again means for each of us that there is life after death. You know, many people shun that truth. And when you're constantly barraged with numbers of death, we're now 400,000 dead, like we're celebrating for some odd reason death. You may have died from sticking your foot in a hole, but you died from COVID. But the fact is, if that was the case, when a tragedy strikes in life, why do we fight on? Because God has put in the human spirit the truth that too late is not too late for him. Do you know right now across the country, across the world, people's lives, their homes, their businesses have been totally wiped out because of some uh, tornado, hurricane, how many, how many storms did, did we have in just the last four months of 2020? I'm not talking about disease. I'm talking simply hurricanes, volcanoes, tornadoes. And we've had even man-made riots that destroyed businesses and homes and trust. Yet people are cleaning up and they're going again. Why? Because built into the human spirit by God is the truth that somehow and in some way it can all rise again. It can be resurrected. Today, we could talk about a pandemic that has created havoc, loss of jobs, loss of economy, business, loss of lives, and even loss of trust in our institutions, in our society. We could theorize what could happen this week in America because of the level of division that exists. But the Lord is desiring for us something different. He says, come up higher this morning. Instead of death and destruction, he wants us to focus on life today. 
Not the 60 million innocent babes who could not defend themselves in the womb, but he wants us to resurrect and look at life today. Someone said in his message, he said, Good Friday represents the worst that man could do, but resurrection represents the best God can do. If in some area of your life you're facing a Good Friday situation, all appears lost, doomed, and defeated in Resurrection Sunday. Jesus rising again is your message of hope, light and victory for you. It may be Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen? Jesus said, those who believe in me, I'm the resurrection of life. Though they die, will, hence, will live again. Will live again. I want to inform you today, my friends, that Jesus wasn't just talking about eternity in heaven. He's talking about your life right here and right now. God doesn't save you just for that one day. You can join your mansion, walk into it with streets of gold. And you do nothing from that point on. That's not his plan. If that be the case, then why are we still here? If the whole point was to get you to your mansion, he should have just took our life the day we got saved. But God does not do things that way. Amen? He loves all mankind. He wills that none would perish. The worst enemy you have in life, you may hate them or feel like you hate them. There's times you want to punch them, but God loves them. He doesn't agree with their behavior and conduct. Did he agree with our behavior and conduct? Absolutely not. But thanks be to God, somebody was being used by the Father in your life. You heard a message one day, and the message resonated in your heart, and you realized what you were. You were lost, and you needed someone to save you. Today, I want to look at three resurrections that occurred in Jesus' ministry and relate them to areas of your life that we all face at some time that God can bring resurrection to all of them, even in the midst of COVID-19. Or is it 21 this year? Has it moved to 21? First one is Luke 8, 49. If you want to turn there, go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. This is the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. It's back toward the end of that chapter, verse 49. I'll just pick it up right there in 49. Because <clears throat> Jesus is healing in the response to faith. How many of you have faith today? Okay. Well, as a matter of fact, if you're born again, you certainly have faith. God's given each man a measure of faith. So if we look at Luke chapter 8. This is the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. In verse 49, it says this. I'm reading for the New Living Translation. While he was still speaking to her, because remember, he had just healed the woman with the issue of, of what? Come on, Bible scholars. That's right. The woman with the issue of blood. How many years was she sick? Anybody remember? 12 years. She'd used every doctor. She'd been to Barnes, Jewish, and Moab, and Mercy. Nobody could heal her. She'd been up to Rochester, Mayo Clinic. Nobody could help her. She'd been down to Houston. No one could help her. She even went to that funky little clinic in Mexico. They couldn't help her. There's only one that could help her. And she met him. Funny thing is, kind of in the midst of all that, here comes the dead daughter situation. Verse 49. While he was still speaking to her, to the woman, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, who had been there and saw with, with own eyes the leader of the synagogue, Jairus is the leader of the synagogue, okay? This is an important man in the community. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith and she'll be healed. Just have faith. What a simple statement. And when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with them except Peter, John, and James, and the little girl's father and mother. Stop for a moment. There's a reason for that. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing. The reason for that, too. She said, stop the weeping. Or he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd did what? They laughed at him. Because they all knew she had died. But they weren't the resurrection of life, were they? Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned. And she immediately stood up. And Jesus told him to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed. Could you imagine? Huh? But Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. The resurrection of Jairus' daughter represents the returning of the vision. 
any parent here, and there's a lot of them sitting here this morning, hears or knows and understands what he's going through. Because contained in a life of that little girl were dreams and visions. How many have had dreams for your kids? Visions for your kids. Maybe Jairus had a vision of his daughter growing up into a beautiful young woman. Vision of her wedding day. Vision of him holding his grandchildren. So many visions, so many dreams. But now they're lying cold on the daughter's bed. And life is draining from her body. Life drains from those visions. A lot of people have had the same experience, same similar situations. The life source of our visions may be contained in many different things, friend. Finances, uh huh. Relationships with other people, maybe church life, job security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let me take the example of our children. They may not be dying of a physical disease, but maybe they are. What about attitude disease? Whatever. When you say the word whatever to a parent, what's that do to your spine, friends? You struggle to communicate with them. You see them wandering down the wrong path of life. Your vision for them may be dying. I love reading the story of the prodigal son. There's a lot of imagery, a lot of underlying truth there. Here's a father who, seeing his son leave home, its values and beliefs, and began a life of waste. You know, I remember this. If you live under my roof, finish that. That's right. You live by my rules. Now, you might chafe under that when you're 16. By the time you're 36, you're thinking, hallelujah. That's what I said. That's not always a bad thing, my friend. If this was in our modern setting, he would have gotten messages about his son's condition daily on social media. All the father's visions for his son were dying. But when the son had come home, the father actually saw him Far off. Why? Because he was looking for his son on the horizon. If I just see a hair pop up over the horizon, it could be him. Why? Because he had a belief in a resurrection. What he thought was dead could come back to life. Too late is not too late for God, my friend. So the word of the Lord today to you and I is don't be afraid. Just simply trust me. You know, that's been resonating in my spirit now, Brandon, for two weeks. The word trustworthy. Trustworthy. Why in the world can I not consider myself to be trustworthy in God? Because he is trustworthy. How many times, we were talking this morning with some believers, how many times has God saved you, has been behind you, has kept you from things you didn't even know was going to happen to you, but God delivered you from out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all, Martha. Then how about this time? Is he not the same God today that he was yesterday, the day before? Back when I was drunk, I could have killed somebody. Thanks be to God. He is trustworthy today. You can tell this is resonating in my spirit this morning. See, Jesus has a totally different perspective on the situation. To the people as he arrived at the house, the girl was dead. True, fact, yes. To Jesus, she was sleeping to see resurrection of our vision, we need to change our perspective or what the life source of our vision actually is. We have to move the vision of our vision from our earthly source to the heavenly source. Thy will be done on as it, there it is, already done in heaven. For the disciples, there are visions and dreams they had as their life source, Jesus, the prophet, the teacher. Listen to the words of two of them on the Emmaus Road. This is the resurrected Jesus, by the way, who's asking them, what things have been happening? <laughs> well, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. He was a prophet who did wonderful miracles. He was a mighty teacher, highly regarded by both God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders arrested him, handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had thought, that means had dreams and visions, that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. That all happened three days ago. Then Jesus starts to explain to them all the prophecies. He stays for supper with them. And the Bible says, as they sat down to eat, he took a small loaf of bread, asked God's blessing on it, broke it, and then gave it to him. And suddenly, Josh, what happened? Their eyes were open, and they recognized him. 
What did they see? They didn't see the man from Nazareth who died on Good Friday, but they saw the Son of God risen on Resurrection Sunday. See, their, their, their vision now had a new life source. Resurrection Sunday says that God can return your vision and your dreams. Number two, quickly, Luke 7, back up a chapter. This is the resurrection of the Nain's widow's only son. And this represents, Dwayne, regaining your future. There's life after UPS, ain't there, brother? Regaining your future. If you look with me to Luke 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went with the disciples to the village of Nain. And a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. You get the, <laughs> all these funerals, even in Jesus' day. My goodness. The young man who had died was a widow's only son. And a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he, he walked over to the coffin and touched it. And the bears stopped. Young man, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up. Dead people don't sit up. Only live people do. And he began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Hallelujah. The dead boy sat up and began to talk. See, for the woman in this story, her husband had already died. Now, her only son, one and only son, is dead. It means her future is very grim indeed. See, because in those days, women had no other means, no other means of support except through the male members of the family. And for this woman, both of them are now dead. Now, put yourself in her shoes. No food stamps. No Medicaid. No Medicare. No $600 or $2,000 stimulus checks. Nothing. Get the picture? A very grim future. See, we just read words and pages. But take yourself and put yourself in her position. She would have nothing. And when he's gone, no enviable future for her. Her mourning and sadness would not only have been for her son, and you could tell she must have loved him deeply. But this funeral day was over and the crowds were gone. She'll be all alone with nothing and no future. What a place to be in. Some of you have walked away from the cemetery. The family now is gone. You go home, and it's just you in the house. Now, you have wherewithal usually now. But you know the feeling you felt when you went home? Just you. I'm going to cook for one now. I get to watch all my favorite TV shows now by myself. I got to shop for myself now. All those things I used to go to with, with my, I, I, it's going to be different. For this widow, her future required that her only son remain alive. So what's that for us today? What do we do to require to remain alive for our future to exist? If that thing was taken from you, if that thing was to die and your future was to vanish, maybe it's a thing, not a person, then you and I will need to know and understand the significance of resurrection. It means it's not too late. David in the Old Testament had his future prophesied over him. You're going to be the next king. Yet time and time again in his life, that future seemed to be dead and buried Yet David was able to write these words, my future is in your hands, Psalm 31, 15. Look it up yourself. Talk about perspective. Isn't it symbolically significant that in this resurrection of the widow's son, it says that Jesus touched the coffin. And people remarked, we have seen the hand of God at work today after he touched the coffin. See, our, our future is not in the hands of whatever we think it is in the hands of. Your future, let me tell you, my friend, your future is not in the government. Let me repeat that. Your future is not in the government. It's not in map testing, ACT scores. It's not in home mortgages, job portfolios, etc. Our future is in the hands of Jesus. 
Those things may die. They may fall. They may fail. Not come up the standard. I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Hallelujah. I think I'd rather stand on that one than knowing tomorrow. Isaiah 53 says, Whom has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Then the writer, he kind of gives an illustration. He's speaking of Jesus. Grew up as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Let me ask you, how well is a root do in the dry ground? One translation uses the term sterile ground. Ground with no life giving properties, sterile. The answer doesn't do very well at all, does it? Jesus, as our example, grew up into his future, not because he was in the right society soil. He didn't go to the right educational institution. He didn't have the cultural conditions for everything to play out right. Can you relate, my friend? Yes? Sure you can. But because the hand of God was upon his life. Isn't that your situation today, believer? Jeremiah, it says in verse 2, go down to the shop where clay pots and jars are made. I will speak to you while you're there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So the potter squashed the jar into a lump of clay and did what? Started all over again. Then the Lord gave me this message. O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If your future right now appears totally messed up. And it's not turning out like you thought it should. It's resurrection time. Which means if you put your whole life in God's hands, he can start you again and remake your future. How about the resurrection of Lazarus? Go with me to John 11. John chapter 11. Now this is a long one. I'm not going to read all of that. John chapter 11. The resurrection, the raising of Lazarus. Let's just go down toward the bottom. Let's just start at verse 38. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. You, most of you know that set up there. It was a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And Jesus told him this, roll the stone aside. A simple commandment. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. She's speaking from a practical point of view. Okay? A practical point of view. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. Look what he did. Thank you for hearing me. Do we do that? Thank you for hearing me today, Lord. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here. So that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted. Didn't say whisper, did it? He shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. And Jesus told him, loose him or unwrap him and let him go. See, Jesus heard Mary and Martha's request for him to come. But he didn't answer them as they wanted in their time frame. Now, can anybody relate in the room? Huh? See, when God's restoring your faith... He doesn't always do it in the time frame we allot him to do it in, right? Hence, maybe that's the problem by which we fail to trust him. I know in my own life, I've reached that point sometimes too. God, are you there? Well, you know he's there. He hears you. Just stay the course, man. Stay the course. What is the issue here? Well, the issue is faith. Because Jesus didn't answer the prayers like they thought he would or should. 
Faith is now waning or lost. So let's, let's go back again. Listen to the statements of both sisters and the mourners. Now, here's Martha. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, guess what? There's the other sister that sit a lot at Jesus' feet, right? Mary. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Sounds like the same person, doesn't it? So both of them are saying, yeah, if you would have been here, but you're here now, so it's too late. Well, this is what the mourner is saying. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? What would be the fun in that, Jesus might be thinking. Let's go one extra, right? And then Jesus, as he stands before the tomb, prays these words. But I said it out loud for the sake of all that these people standing here, so they'll believe that you sent me. Because he is the resurrection. See, faith stands not on answered prayers, but it actually stands on announced words. Jesus says, I am. Same thing he said way back in the Old Testament. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live again. Now, Jesus may not have come through like we would want him to, but he's still the I am. He's already declared it. See, your family member may not have been healed, and they may have died, but Jesus is still I am. The bill is overdue. And God did not come through with the finances as you thought, but Jesus is still the I am. The person is still getting on your nerves at work, but he hasn't changed them, but Jesus is still the I am. And sometimes the walls may feel like they're closing in. I can't find a door. I can't find a window to escape through, but he's still the I am. If you ever you can go back on YouTube now and listen to the testimonies of the people that survived and came out of that tower, those towers in 9-11. It's, it's incredible. You ask them today, they'd stand on Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently, let me repeat, diligently seek him. He rewards those who diligently seek him. If I told each of you today there's a million dollar check under a chair in this room, how many would get up from your seat right now and go looking for it? You'd come to the front. You'd move Jeanette out. You'd probably throw her out of the chair. Get up from here. I'm going to get my million dollars. Now, some of you wouldn't be as rude. Some might be. How diligently do we seek after him? Or is it only after I check my list off and I'll get back to you? When it's convenient, Lord. Silence. See, that's usually the case with us humans, including me. Why do we allow ourselves to get to that point, my friend? See, faith is the substance of hope. Evidence of the unseen. The substance of the Christian life, the evidence of the Christian walk is faith. So much of how God wants us to live as believers is in the arena of hope and a field of the unseen. Amen. God wants us to believe that he is not in what we have seen and have, but he is. He is is beyond the past. He is is beyond the future. It is. He is. You may not have lost your faith today. God didn't come through like you want. Or you may have lost your faith today. Well, maybe the faith wasn't founded right. Maybe it was based on what God could do for you rather than God wants to be to you. There's a big difference, isn't it? Well, you didn't do for me, Lord. Well, that's not what I'm about. What am I to you? He didn't say, I am the great I do. I am the great I am. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And you can believe that no matter what you see. You see a lot of things. You hear a lot of things. It all depends on what source you're seeing and you're hearing, my friend. The enemy loves to seduce you. How does he do it? Through deception. We talked about this not long ago. If he came to that side door right there, and he was dressed like proverbial Satan, Lucifer devil, his red outfit, his little pitchfork, and he's 
pointy tail and his horns and he's breathing fire. And he talks like this. Let me in. Let me in. Hey, I should use that voice for the drama, shouldn't I? That'd kill me, I think. <clears throat> Where's he come dressed like Marty? Hey, dude, let me in, man. We're going to have a good time. I got a plaid shirt, too, just like that, Marty. I actually do. Hey, you, you have good taste in clothing. Come on in. Yeah. Or he may come in dressed like, see if I had a little piece of white tape. I didn't wear this shirt to do this, but. What do I represent now? Clergy. Sanctus omnus holus. He comes like that too, doesn't he? Or sometimes he comes like this, ladies. Or men. That's all I'm taking off, Sharon. <laughs> you get it. We laugh, but every day, every moment of every day, guess what he's doing? He's showing up at your door, dressing a thing. That'll seduce you. Paul calls them the sins that so easily entangle us. Someone here might say, well, pastor, my life's too messed up. God cannot do anything with me. My life is too far gone. How many people, John, do we run into? I've told this story about the 95-year-old man who came to my services on Wednesday at Gibbs for probably two years. He was actually a member of of a sister church in the community. How could God forgive me you know, for what I've done? And I said, well, do you believe his word? He says he'll forgive you. Anything you've done is not too much for the blood of Jesus to cover and cleanse and wipe away from your life. And I trust at the end he was able to do that. I believe at 97. You think it's too late for you? <laughs> no. God can save you, my friend. You know, on Good Friday, there was, a, there was a thief next to Jesus. Actually, there were two. I always found it interesting that Jesus put right in the middle of them. He's the one who will come between the thing, the part of you that denies him, but the part of you that wants to come to him. In the last moments of this man's life. Now, the world may say, too late for both of you dudes. You're getting what you deserve. Correct? Now, and here's, here's the sad thing. There would be people from the church, the local church, who'd stand at the bottom and say, huh, getting what you deserve. You fought against everything I ever believed in. You're getting what you deserve. How easy it is for us to do that. I'm not condemning. I'm just saying how easy it is for us to do this because I can do the same thing. But here's the man hanging in the middle who's feeling what he's feeling, except he's feeling more because he's got my sin on him. He's got my punishment on him. And guess what? He's got yours. And the man says, hey, this man in the middle's done nothing wrong. But we're guilty. I know what I've done is wrong. Admission of guilt, the recognition of the Savior. And he says, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Well, no man has a kingdom unless he's a king. And Jesus says, I assure you, today. See, today... His resurrection Sunday. Today. Did you know tomorrow, Sharon, Monday is resurrection Monday? Guess what, my friend? Tuesday's not for tacos only. It's a resurrection Tuesday. Amen. You will not want to run for the border after you get resurrected. You might need that if you eat too many tacos at Taco Bell. And so it's Wednesday and Thursday. Any day is a good day for resurrection. Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I, I can't think honestly. and I've never claimed to be so-and-so preacher. I, I don't want any of that stuff. I just simply, I just simply want to be a man who God looks at and says, you know what? Well done. I've learned to trust him. 
I've learned to walk in humility. I don't point fingers at anybody else because I got enough pointing back at myself. But I want other people to know what it feels like to be resurrected. I want you to know that those things that God has placed in you are not dead. They just simply need resurrected. But they'll only find life source in Christ. You're not going to find them in all this other stuff. You understand? And whatever happens this week in D.C. on Wednesday or wherever, Jesus is still my Lord and my Savior and my Messiah. I've lived through about six or seven presidents, some of you more, some of you less. You know what? Jesus is still the same yesterday and day and forever. He changeth not. His word will come to pass. Guaranteed, right, Bill? His word will come to pass. You can bank on it. That's FDIC. You can bank on it. But guess what? If you put your feet, how many were here last Sunday when Dana gave her testimony? She stood on God's word. Stood on God's word. I want to tell you what, how I felt about this word. I don't know if anybody else knows this. I don't even know if I told my wife. When we bought our property, I don't know, was that 17 years ago? I think 17, 18 years ago. I was so grateful that God was able to give us that piece of property. Now, he gave it to us at a price. We had to pay for it. I'm still paying for it. But I wanted to dedicate that land. I really, and I didn't want to be weird about it. But I simply did this on my own by myself. I took a, I took a Bible. It was called the Touch Points. Anybody remember the Touch Points Bible? I took that Bible. I went out one day, and I can't even tell you exactly where I did this, but I took my shovel. It was an afternoon in the fall, and I dug a hole, and I took the Bible, and I threw it in the hole. I said, Lord, I'm not a perfect person, but God, I need you. I need your word. And I said, I'm going to raise my family on this land. I want this land to be on your word. So I took that Bible, and I threw it in the hole, and I covered it up. I walked away. That's what I want my life to be like. That's what I want your life to be like. See, we're family here today. We're brothers and sisters. It's not, it's not, it's not the scarlet blood that brings us together. It's the blood of Christ. And it's his spirit too. It's twofold things. It's his spirit because his spirit lives in us. And the blood of Jesus cleanses all of us from unrighteousness. Man, that makes us even stronger than even actual blood family. Because we've got the spirit and the blood together. Hallelujah. That's a double whammy, Sharon. You're not my enemy. You're my brother. You're my sister. We lock arms together. So if you're, it, it, like if your faith is waiting, I need to come along and help you grab a hold of my arm. We're going to go together. When your faith is waiting, I'll help you. When my faith is waiting, come up here and I'll help you. There's times my faith wanes. Hello? Is there time your faith wanes? It certainly does. There's times when you're weak. Listen, there's a pall across the nation. There's a darkness that's swept in the nation because of this nonsense that's going on. Why? Because people won't turn to God. It's not that they can't. They reject him. Atheism, God doesn't believe in atheist. Hello? Every man can believe in God. They just don't want to. They reject him. Why? Because they have to reject his ways. You reject God, you're rejecting who he is, what he stands for, what he believes, what he says is right. If you don't want to follow that, well, you reject him. There's always a price to pay, isn't there? Always. Hello. You better wake up some folks. Hear me. One of the reasons you're seeing what you're seeing today, it isn't just about some crazy virus developed in a lab and all that kind of stuff. And and global takeover. That's part of it. This is what I really see happening right now. The church has become what he never designed for it to be. I'm speaking about America. Whenever God allows a pandemic, it's a message to the church. Clean up. Get right. It's exactly what he's saying to the church. An epidemic, a pandemic, whatever you want to call it. God's allowing this to happen, to cleanse, to purge, to strengthen his church. And I'll end it this way. He's coming back for church without what? A spot or wrinkle. Now, I do some laundry, don't I, dear? I do some laundry. But some laundry has spots 
that are hard to get out. Anybody ever got a grape stain? You do laundry? You better go. Sometimes you got to get, what's that, shout it out and spray and wash, those types of ingredients. There's something special in there that you put on that spot, right, Stephen? Oh, where's your wife? I'll talk to her. And then you have to do what? You have to friction. Oh, my. Here's a man after God's own heart who does his own laundry. You have to rub it. Why? Because friction. You have to scrub it, soak it, and then scrub it. You know what an iron is? How does an iron work? Heat and pressure. God's coming back for the church without spot or wrinkle. How many like to have a hot iron on you? You know, sometimes you feel like you've got a hot iron in your life. You ask the average person in America today, they feel like they've been having iron on them, heat and pressure. Now, the church is going to go through some heat and pressure before it's all said and done. You know that. If you don't believe that, you need to read the book again. In spots. God says, I'm cleaning the spots and I'm ironing out your wrinkles because I want to present you as a beautiful bride. So there's a positive result, not a negative. Don't shake your fist and God says, God, I can't take the heat. I don't like the pressure. Stop, stop rubbing out my spots. He's doing it because he loves you. He wants to present you at the wedding feast as a beautiful bride, pure and holy before him. That's what God is doing. Don't look at it any other way. God is preparing us. You know what? He's going to use you. If you allow him to, he's going to use you in these next weeks, months, years, however long it's going to be, he's going to use you. If you allow him to, he'll use you in people's lives, Sally, to bring them into the kingdom that you're in. There'll be a lot more thieves on the cross come to Jesus. Amen? And he'll assure you today they'll be with him in paradise. Are you ready? Are you? You sure? Have you looked in the mirror? Now, have you looked in the spiritual mirror? You know what the spiritual mirror is? Hold it up, Mike. Right there. The Holy Bible. That's your spiritual mirror. Because when you open it up, you'll see yourself as you should be. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, I thank you for the precious people in this room. Everyone is precious in your sight. We'll go back to how this day is kind of honored as the Sanctity of Life Day. Every person in this room, you saw them before they were formed in their mother's womb. If you saw Dave and Jeremiah, you saw us. There's no difference. And you knew what was ahead for our lives. In your grace and your incredible mercy, we are here today. Now, Father, how many will do this? If you just lift up your hands, you just say this with me. Father, in Jesus' name, cleanse my spots. Iron out my wrinkles. I desire to be pure and holy before you. Use me for your advantage to build your kingdom. The one the enemy hates. But greater is he in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Why don't you thank the Lord Jesus this morning? He is good. He is faithful. He is powerful. And he's a God of resurrection. Let your heart, let your dreams, let your visions, your future be resurrected. Don't let a virus, a pandemic, or or dissension or division that goes on around in a political realm. Don't let it get you off course. Please hear me. Your manual is the Word of God. Your general is the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let Him speak to you. Just say, yes, sir. Here I am. I'll do what you tell me. You'll see how well it goes with your life. Amen? Love you all. That's right. The darkest hour is the dawn. It means the dawn is just on its on the side. You need to find that album for me. I love that song. More, may the Lord bless you. May His face shine upon you and your family as you seek His face and you seek His will for your life. Amen. Go in His peace and His strength and His power. 
And above all, be ready with your reason of hope. Be ready to tell somebody. Give them your testimony. They can't argue with that. Amen? See, this is what I once was, blind, but now I can see. Hallelujah. God bless all of you.